this guy is the true grassroots of the Second Amendment movement. I bring you Larry Pratt. And a good evening to you. I am so glad that Paul has invited me to be here with you. I'm delighted to see how many of you there are. You know, the, um, I don't think the establishment has gotten the message yet, but a message was sent from the 7th District of Virginia last week that there's a new four-letter word in use. Brat it, brat it, brat it. <laughs> they are still stunned that somebody like Eric Cantor could go down. And we are so happy he did. We took, we took part in that campaign toward the end. We began to realize uh, a little sooner than other people, but almost too late all the same, that, hey, this guy might have it together. Uh, well, did, we thought we were going to go down with a worthy cause, but at least uh, we needed to send a little uh, unidigital salute to Mr. Cantor. Little did we realize this guy was going to go across the finish line. And he um, hopefully has uh, given new energy to other people similarly engaged, either against a, a rhino in a primary or some other form of socialist in the general election. The, um, the ruling class is, really has trouble accepting new information. I uh, give you exhibit A, Shotgun Joe. The vice president, who uh, has all this advice for the ladies as to which is the preferred gun for them, not one of those nasty AR-15s, but a shotgun, of course. And within days, uh, at least one wag had a, a video together that showed one woman after another falling flat on her back, shotgun flying out of her hands, obviously having not been instructed as to what to expect. And then the last frame was a lady at a range controlled fire, boom, 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 with an AR-15. Uh, I know somebody that knows the vice president personally. He made that information available to him. This person is a Second Amendment expert, a firearms expert, bar none. And it was like water on a duck's back. Liberals live in a fact-free environment. The. Uh, but they play for keeps because they've been trying to tar us and others who object to the rise or the continued bloating of big government and its dangers, including their efforts to disarm the peasants, us. Uh, they have responded by language that could be quite fatal if it's not checked because they are calling us from the very top of the regime in Washington, they're calling people like us potential terrorists, returning veterans, pro-lifers. Uh, the American Family Association is a hate group. Now, I may have described half of the people in here, I don't know, but uh, that's, that's what they're up to, and it's what the Nazis did to the Jews, it's what the, the Soviets did to the Ukrainian farmers, it's what has been done by tyrants throughout history, demonize, disarm, kill. And so the Second Amendment is needed very much today, as it always has been, of course, because it's that knowledge in the back of many politicians' mind that it is there and that they perhaps ought to recognize some limits. One of our members was talking to a very liberal congresswoman one time, and that probably doesn't happen too often. But anyway, um, he was, he admitted it, and he said, and it was not a gun issue. He was, whatever it was, he was talking to her about it, but she knew that he was connected with a gun rights organization. And out of the middle of nowhere, she said, I bet you want to shoot me, don't you? Well, lady, that's what the Second Amendment is all about. That's what it is all about. So keep that in your mind as you write your tyrannous uh, laws, because it just might come into play one of these days. That's what it is there for. The, um, we've seen a lot of shortcomings in this leadership. But one of the reasons we're happy that Eric Cantor is Kaputsky is that he was one of those very instrumental in a, a surprise, like an ambush on the floor of the House. A handful of rhino Republicans joined the Democrats 
in voting some more money so that the states could turn more names of people into the federal computers for more people not to be able to get guns. Really cool, Eric Cantor. Thanks a million. Actually, thanks 10 million. Um, then um, we uh, have seen what the president meant by uh, using his pen and his phone. That's what op uh, Operation Choke Point uh, was all of, is all about. They're putting the squeeze on gun stores through the, through the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, saying, well, these are dangerous businesses, therefore uh, they have to be charged higher interest rates, or not higher, I'm sorry, uh, uh, they have to be charged higher rates for their fees for their uh, handling credit cards or dropped altogether. Now, happily, the free market has come to the rescue and uh, a number of entities, hopefully Gun Owners of America will join them soon with a satellite company, uh, processing check, uh, credit cards for merchants that are being hammered by the regime. The, um, I'd like to give you a little uh, background on how the Toomey Mansion gun control, gun registration bill was killed. We were probably about two weeks out from the vote and we hadn't heard from the NRA. And so we thought, you know, uh, Piers Morgan has given us this Piers Morgan Memorial email list. As everybody came onto our server crashing it three times to uh, find out what we were all about. And uh, a lot of them stayed uh, to get our email and things of that sort uh, to help out in the lobbying. Well, we thought maybe we better lobby our big brother because we really need him now. This thing could pass. Uh, it was a very touch and go uh, enterprise that we were engaged in. So we put out the email saying, look, if you're an, ER, an NRA member, and only if you are, would you please call this guy at this number at the NRA and ask him to get the powers that be to publicly oppose uh, the Toomey Mansion bill. And a week later, I mean, just kind of pinching ourselves still, that's what happened. Well, the next thing was even more surprising. Senator Manchin went screaming to the media, I've been betrayed. The NRA's done a 180. We almost had this bill in the bag. We had no idea what was going on. We came so close. So Piers Morgan, wherever you are, if you're listening through an NSA monitor, we love you, Piers. <laughs> One of the things that Cantor uh, did to get our ire, and we're still not sure we're out of the woods with this weasel, is that he's been pushing amnesty. And if he does that, it's the end of the Republican Party, but much more important, it's the end of our republic. Because, look, I, I speak Spanish, I'm in an Hispanic church, and I know what I'm talking about. These are 85% Democrats, and when you vote Democrat, you vote for gun control. And Cantor seems to think immigration is going to win their hearts and minds. Well, I got news for you, Eric Cantor, that's not going to happen not in the near run. It's going to take a lot of work through churches and other entities where, where these folks are worked one-on-one. -on -one. And, and the idea that you pass some bill uh, to give them a, a vote, they're going to say thanks, but no thanks. It's just that simple. So for us, this bill was a grave existential threat to the Second Amendment because 10, 15 years after uh, Canner's fantasy is materialized, we're toast. Politically, we're finished. So that's why we were so happy to see Cantor go down. We'd, we were sorry that Boehner uh, didn't go down, but he only got 60% against a 30-year-old vet with no money. And maybe some other people will now be encouraged that they can go do some more rhino hunting. I saw this marvelous photo. I couldn't find it before I came up. Uh, but it depicts a, like a 1910, perhaps, scene, black and white photo, a couple of European hunters with their long guns uh, standing near a dead rhino. And the caption on this is, somewhere in Virginia. <laughs> One of the things that's got me encouraged is the opportunity that we've had uh, to work with Senator Cruz and Senator Lee. Probably it was around the beginning of August, there was a meeting in Senator Lee's office with a number of groups, number of people like yours truly that headed up, groups that had already opposed 
Obamacare, or as I prefer to call it, zero care. We were opposing it because it was going to shovel names of people that had never been adjudicated in a court of law with any due process onto a federal list, and then, then they lose their right to keep and bear arms. And so we had been a long and vocal opponent of zero care, and we were there with other similarly situated conservative groups. At the meeting also was Senator Cruz, and the thing that I had almost never heard from another politician was, look, I don't know whether we're going to win or lose this fight, but we have got to fight. Wow. That's what I had been waiting for a long time, to hear somebody say he's in it for the long haul. He may lose some battles, but he's in it to win the war. And uh, that was very encouraging, because watching this guy is um, to watch somebody who's really smart and really handles himself well. Uh, I think we, we've got a leader that we've been looking for. Clive and Bundy and the events that un came about at the um, uh, ranch there near uh, uh, Bunkerville, uh, Nevada, probably is our greatest current example of why we have a Second Amendment. Federal government has been doing things with land that it has no constitutional authority to do for years and years. And finally, somebody stood up to him and said, I'm not going to be pushed around anymore. And to my pleasant surprise and amazement, a lot of other Americans agreed. And they went out there at the drop of a hat to defend this man. I was called by uh, Stuart Rhodes, who heads up Oath Keepers, uh, to attend uh, a news conference that was going to be held in the ranch, uh, at the ranch, the Saturday, the Monday after the feds ended up folding on Saturday. So I was on my way, uh, almost on my way to the airport, and I got a call from Stuart and said, well, they've gone. Uh, and they fled because they couldn't quite believe that the American people would stand up to them. And one of the things that I learned that was uh, kind of frightening when the cowboys and I think some cowgirls were riding toward the corral to set the cattle free, they had guns aimed at them, not at the ready, at them. And they were convinced that they were, some of them were going to get shot. So at the last minute, the feckless sheriff department finally came together with all the publicity that was emanating via the internet, uh, and we were able to watch this unfold real time, and the deputy went up to one of the BLM boys and said, do you want to be known as the, uh, as the folks that gunned down unarmed men and women? And apparently it was a good question because the guy had no answer and they did stand down. And so it really tells you the importance of a sheriff's department. The sheriff was late to the game, uh, but finally when he realized that I better look like a sheriff, he sent his deputy out there and it worked. The, the supremacy of the sheriff is a doctrine that operates in almost every state of our country. And the Second Amendment was then under the proper authority of an elected county sheriff. And I think that was the way the episode should have ended and the way it did end. And memo to Washington, it can happen again. In fact, it was in the verge of happening again, if you might have seen, although not in the pages of any of the major media, that on the Red River, the boundary between Oklahoma and Texas, all private land always has been private land. They were talking about grabbing some land because of this, that, or the other furbish lock horse or whatever, you know, some non-existent uh, vegetation. And uh, the militia in both states said, uh, we'll see you there. And they didn't even have to deploy. The feds got the message. This is not the time to be messing around with the American people. We've had it. Eric Cantor knows it. And others are going to know it, too. I would say, in closing, that if you had one question and one demand that you might make on your particularly members of the House or those running for uh, such a position. Are you going to work to get the spineless leadership of your party to defund X, Y, and Z programs 
per, let's start particularly with not raising the debt limit. Let's start with defunding zero care, and then we can go on from there to other things that need to be equally dealt with uh, as urgently. Uh, then I think if we, if we inject that into these campaigns, they will realize that what, what happened to Eric Cantor was not a fluke. Eric Cantor was the first burst of lava coming out of a pent-up volcano that has finally burst forth. So let's do it, folks.